The prison guard strapped Lincoln's limbs onto the electric chair. To increase conductivity, the guard shaved off his hair and placed a metal helmet with wet sponges on his head. All the preparations were complete, and the execution began right on time. The warden gave Brad a signal, and Brad pulled back the curtains. Lincoln bid farewell to his loved ones. Suddenly, Lincoln sees a familiar face and tries to tell Michael to turn around. Michael didn't understand what he meant, and in the end, Lincoln was still forced to wear the helmet and endure this cruel torture. At that crucial moment, the phone rang, and the curtains closed. Michael looked panicked, unaware of what was happening. Michael and Veronica silently prayed for Lincoln. The warden announced that a higher court had received new evidence, and the execution would be postponed. Lincoln, who narrowly escaped death, emerged. He told Michael that he saw their father. Michael was astonished. Their father had abandoned them 30 years ago. It was impossible for him to suddenly appear now. It was only when Veronica found the judge that they learned about an anonymous letter received, containing a coroner's report on the vice president's brother. The deceased had an appendix, but the vice president's brother had undergone an appendectomy at a young age. This indicated that the deceased was not the vice president's brother. Although this did not prove that Lincoln was innocent of murder, it at least showed that there was a massive conspiracy involved. The news quickly reached the vice president, who learned that Lincoln was not executed and immediately ordered her subordinates to investigate the reason. According to surveillance footage, the person delivering the anonymous letter was very cautious, but through the reflection on the glass door, his appearance could be clearly seen. That person was Lincoln's father, whom the vice president's subordinates also recognized. From her expression, it was evident that they were old adversaries. Michael gathered his team to begin a new round of escape planning. The current plan is to reach the wellhead in the courtyard through the lounge corridor and then walk 50 meters to the psychiatric hospital. Finally, they would go through the sewer system in the psychiatric hospital area and make their way to the infirmary. The major issue is that they might be spotted by prison guards while crossing the courtyard. Michael knows this is the only way to escape so he decides to explore the route at night to familiarize himself with it. The underground pipes in the psychiatric hospital area have been extensively modified, making the layout complex. In preparation for this day, Michael had tattooed the pipe layout on his back in advance. Sucre is extremely worried, but just as he's getting desperate, he sees his cousin, giving him an idea. His cousin's job is to clean clothes for both prisoners and guards. Sucre borrows a set of guard uniforms from him so that Michael won't be noticed when coming out of the sewer system, successfully evading the searchlights. Michael pretends to need the restroom and manages to blend in within the psychiatric hospital area. Using the map's guidance, he quickly finds the manhole cover leading to the infirmary. However, on his way back, he unexpectedly encounters a patrolling guard. Michael hides in a corner, not daring to make a sound even though he gets burned by a pipe. To avoid being discovered and raise any alarms, he must quickly take off the guard uniform. At this moment, the fabric of the clothes is already stuck to Michael's burnt skin. After much hesitation, Sucre ultimately helps Michael remove the uniform. Michael lets out a pained cry. And ultimately, he is caught by the prison guard. The warden interrogates Sucre about why he attacked Michael. Unable to come up with an answer, Sucre ends up being put in solitary confinement for a day. Michael is taken to the infirmary, where Sarah asks him what happened, but he remains silent. Sarah discovers fibers from a material that resemble the fabric of guard uniforms among the clean substances, which raises her suspicions about him. Returning to his cell, Michael removes the bandage from his wound and realizes that the burn aligns perfectly with the underground pipe map. Without the guidance of a map, they would not be able to escape from the complex pipes. And the prison break plan was in jeopardy. Sarah was worried about Michael being bullied by the guards, so she reported the matter to the warden. The warden instructed Michael to identify the guilty guard. Unable to answer, Michael ended up being put in solitary confinement. All their efforts seemed futile, and Michael looked at his clothes putting them in his mouth and tearing them apart with force. He kept recalling the prison map in his mind, trying to construct it using strips of fabric. Despite his continuous attempts, he couldn't recreate it. Michael completely lost his sanity, punching the walls relentlessly, not feeling any pain even as blood flowed. The guards noticed Michael's deteriorating state and urgently called for a doctor. Sarah arrived at the solitary confinement cell and saw the walls covered in patterns made with blood. With hands covered in blood, Michael sat motionless, and Sarah lifted his head. Michael's eyes were vacant, his face devoid of any expression, leading her to conclude that he had lost his sanity. Sarah called the warden, who upon seeing Michael in this state, instructed her to take him to the psychiatric hospital area. Witnessing Michael becoming mentally unstable, 
Sarah felt somewhat disheartened, as soon as the doctor left. Michael, with a vacant gaze, suddenly returned to normal. It turned out to be his scheme. Pretending to be mentally ill was his way of getting into the psychiatric hospital area. He wanted to find his former cellmate, Charles, and plan for him to redraw the lost map. He mentioned that Charles's theory was correct. It was indeed a map of the pipes. He tried to jog Charles's memory and get him to draw it. Charles's response devastated Michael he didn't remember him at all. Patiently, Michael engaged in conversation with Charles, discussing their past and the map. Charles leaned in, observing Michael closely, finally recognizing him Michael was the one who stole his toothpaste. The mentally ill patients have to take tranquilizing medication every day. Because Michael was feigning illness, he knew that he didn't need to take the medication, he tried to resist, but was forced to swallow the pills anyway. After the doctor left, he spat out the pills he had hidden in his mouth, and then he found Charles to continue helping him recall the details of the tattoo. Due to the medication, Charles's mind became muddled and chaotic, to keep him alert. After taking the pills, Michael would dig them out of his mouth. Through Michael's relentless efforts, Charles finally regained his previous memories. Michael brought paper and pen, bearing his back for Charles to complete the missing parts of the map. At the same time, Charles also remembered how Michael framed him. What was even more dangerous was that he figured out it was a prison break map. He held the map and pressured Michael into taking him along, and Michael reluctantly agreed. Relying on memory, he drew a map, but not just one. That night, he attempted a discreet escape, but triggered an alarm before even leaving. He thought Michael was setting him up again. He tried to resist but was subdued by the doctors with electric shocks. After obtaining the drawings, Michael asked the doctors to inform Sarah that his mental condition had returned to normal. He pleaded with Sarah to find a way to get him out of there. Sarah told Michael that the warden demanded he reveal the truth about his burn injury. Otherwise, the warden would continue to keep him in solitary confinement. By that time, if Michael appeared mentally unstable, he would still be sent back here. To think that such a humane place existed within the prison walls. He took small sips, oozing charm and allure. Teabag's biggest obsession was the exposed underwear of that person, and it was because of that underwear that the entire prison break team was saved. They were in the common room discussing their escape plans when a guard approached. He said that Brad complained they were working too slowly, and tomorrow they would bring in professional workers for renovation. Once they arrived, the prison break plan would be completely exposed. When everyone was at a loss, Michael revealed his plan. At that moment, another guard approached Michael and informed him that the warden wanted to see him. Before leaving, Michael finished explaining his plan. The remaining people were called to the yard to work. Now the problem was that someone had to return to the common room at night to cover up the hole. All eyes turned to Sucre because he was Michael's roommate, and he was the only one who could go back to the common room tonight. Sucre disagreed. Even if he patched up the hole and returned, he wouldn't be able to escape. If caught, he would face 10 years of imprisonment. If he refused to go, the entire team would be in danger. Just as Sucre was at a loss, he saw that man and instantly had an idea. He found Teabag and asked him to steal that man's red underwear. Teabag reluctantly agreed for the sake of the whole team. Soon, he brought Sucre what he wanted. Late at night, Sucre moved the sink and made his way to the common room, quickly covering up the hole. On his way back, he was caught by a spotlight and taken to the interrogation room. Brad interrogated him about why he wanted to escape. Sucre claimed he didn't want to escape, but someone threw something to him from outside. Brad ordered his men to search Sucre and indeed they found something. So Sucre was also put in solitary confinement. With three key members of the escape team now in solitary confinement, the prison break plan faced another crisis. Since both Michael and Sucre were in solitary confinement, their cells were temporarily vacant. The deputy captain examined Michael's room and realized it was one of the better cells in the prison. He planned to auction off the cell. Prisoners who came to visit during their break were constantly streaming in, and someone even raised the price to $200. As the person was about to leave, he noticed a leaking sink and said he would only pay once it was fixed. The deputy captain agreed to have it resolved within a day and submitted an application to the maintenance department. Teabag, who was next door, noticed everything and immediately sought out Benjamin and D.B. Cooper. If maintenance personnel were to come, they would surely discover the escape tunnel. Exposing their entire prison break plan, Benjamin found the deputy captain and decided to book Michael's cell for $500. Although he had made quite a bit of money in prison, most of it had been borrowed by his former underlings, so he had to collect debts. Since joining the escape team, his brothers had kicked him out of the gang. Not only did he not receive his money, he was also beaten up. 
leaving him completely helpless. D.B. Cooper, although wealthy, didn't have access to his money outside of prison. Teabag came up with an idea and looked towards the Mexican guys behind them. He knew they would bribe the guards at night and gather in the kitchen for gambling. He believed he could win money with his gambling skills, but he didn't have the initial $50 capital. At that moment, D.B. Cooper remembered that he had given Michael a Bible, inside which there was a $100 bill. It should still be in Michael's cell. So, he used the excuse of wanting to see Michael's room and convinced the guards to open the cell. Taking the opportunity to take the Bible, he handed $100 to Teabag, staking their lives on tonight's gamble. With Teabag and Benjamin's perfect coordination, they quickly won $500. Benjamin handed the money to the guards. By this time, the price had already been raised to $700. Helpless, Benjamin had to find D.B. Cooper and ask him to bring out his gold pocket watch. The guards' greed seemed insatiable, no matter how much they offered. In a desperate moment, Lincoln came up with an idea and asked Sucre's cousin to complete the task. Sucre's cousin then told Michael about the plan. He secretly took the burned police uniform and gave it to D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper went to the common room and placed the uniform in the guard's locker. Michael filed a complaint with the warden, claiming that the deputy captain had injured him and stolen D.B. Cooper's gold pocket watch. The warden headed straight to the guard's rest area. In his wardrobe, he found $500, the burned clothes, and D.B. Cooper's gold watch. With both witness and physical evidence, the guard had no chance to defend himself and was ultimately fired. As he left, Bellick bid him farewell. Michael and Sucre successfully returned to their cells, and the prison break plan was back on track. At that moment, a bus drove into the prison. It turned out John had recovered and returned. The young hip-hop guy was feeling miserable, as returning to his cell each time was a nightmare for him. He would always hide in a corner and cry alone. He wasn't really a bad person. He had only stolen a baseball card, which landed him in prison. Unaware of its high value, Michael approached him and asked for help in stealing something the key to the infirmary door. Because the new route required passing through the infirmary and climbing out through the window using the cable. In exchange, the boy wanted Michael to help him kill his roommate. This request crossed Michael's moral line, and they ultimately didn't reach a cooperation agreement. Helpless, Michael had no choice but to do it himself. He planned to seize the opportunity during a medication exchange to obtain the key. Seeing Sarah's care for him, Michael kissed her and expressed his love. Although the key was right in front of him, Michael couldn't bring himself to take it. He had to call the stripper for help. Michael paid to redeem her freedom, and she was very grateful. She didn't want to get involved in the case and agreed to help Michael one last time, after which they would have no more debts between them. Taking the opportunity when Sarah finished work, the stripper approached her. She said she had something important to discuss with Sarah. Regarding Michael, Sarah followed her to a cafe, but before she could say much, the stripper was in a hurry to leave. Then, using the excuse of visiting, she found Michael and handed him the stolen key. The young hip-hop guy was being abused by his roommate again. He pretended to invite his roommate onto his bed, but when the big guy was ready for pleasure, the boy pulled out a blade. <laughs> Word of this incident spread throughout the prison, and Sucre also told Michael about it. The big guy didn't accuse the boy because he didn't want him to be put in solitary confinement. That way, he could seek revenge once he recovered. Feeling guilty for betraying the boy before, Michael decided to escape with him. He found the boy and explained the specific escape plan to him. Sarah returned to the infirmary and realized that the key was missing. She wondered about the stripper's strange behavior. Later, she checked the visitor log and indeed found that the woman had been to the prison. Michael took the opportunity to return the key, but it didn't matter anymore. Sarah understood that she was just a tool for Michael, and his confession had ulterior motives. She didn't know what Michael was planning, so she decisively had the locks changed. Seeing the changed locks, Michael felt desperate. To make matters worse, the boy had no intention of joining Michael. He used Michael's secret as leverage and asked Brad to change rooms for him. Brad, who knew the news, went to the common room and started pounding the ground with a sledgehammer. Discovering something unusual. Please subscribe to my channel. Share different movies and videos every day.